السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Welcome everybody from around the world. My name is Bilal Abdul Kareem, and uh, I am here because we need to have a Q&A session, particularly at this time revolving around the incidents and the bombings and the killings which have been taking place here in the freed territories um, here in northern Hama, uh, southern Idlib, and other places. So we're going to need to get started because it's very, very important that people understand the nuances in what is exactly happening at this time. Firstly, we are broadcasting on Facebook and we're also broadcasting on YouTube and Twitter. So we're going to be taking your questions and I'm just getting this thing uh, uh, ready here. We're going to be taking your questions uh, uh, when uh, just in a few short minutes and we're going to explain exactly what is taking place um, these days. Now let me just get this all together here so when your questions do come um, we are set up for that uh, and we will go here and okay alright so let's get started here now firstly what is taking place here these days number one the resumed bombing campaign by the regime forces and to a very, very lesser extent their Russian counterparts has resumed on a high level. Um, there have been uh, numerous killings which have taken place in the northern Hema area and in the southern Idlib area, but it's not limited only to those areas. It's been happening in other places uh, and we're talking about in the countryside around the city of Idlib and in other places, but there are few reasons why we believe that this is continuing and happening at this particular time. Now, we have to let you know that uh, we here at OGN have been spending extensive time um, in the border areas um, on the rebel side that's facing off against the regime. We're talking about in northern Hema and we're also talking about in the, in the Latakia areas as well. And what did we see? Well, there's increased troop, troop movements in those areas. Now, now we're talking about um, uh, uh, vast reinforcements and military hardware. For example, in areas where there may have been no tanks or maybe one tank uh, for the most part, and we're talking about on the regime side, um, there are now four and five uh, uh, tanks. Um, we're seeing large troop uh, movements on those areas. So it is possible that the regime may be gearing up for and offensive to try to retake certain strategic areas from rebel forces. But the question now has to be, why? Why now? What's different about what's happening now that was not happening, uh, we'll say, uh, some time ago? Firstly, before we answer that question, we want to let people know something. In regime territories, there is a huge uh, uh, blockage or um, when we're talking about fuel, fuel is not reaching the regime controlled areas. We're talking about people that have had to park their vehicles because there's no fuel to be had in order to be able to power them. Now, a lot of people may be sitting there saying, wait a minute, you may be talking about rebel controlled areas, right? No, we're not talking about rebel controlled areas. We're talking about the regime areas. Why? Because the regime, because, the, uh, because of the war and the fact that a lot of their uh, fuel, uh, I'm talking about uh, their petroleum and their uh, uh, gas and oil areas are under uh, areas that are not directly under the control of the regime. So therefore, they've had to import 80%, 80% of their fuel in order to be able to service the people in their territories. They got that fuel, for the most part, from the Iranians. And now we're going to talk about the crux of the matter here. Once again, before we get into this, I want to remind everybody, we are on YouTube, we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, and we are very, very uh, willing to uh, take your questions. Now, as we made mention, uh, we now want to talk about why we're seeing this uptick in, uh, in attacks on the rebel side. Firstly, Donald Trump, the U.S. president, levied sanctions against the regime uh, last year 
As everyone knows, the United States pulled out of the nuclear agreement which was signed under the Obama administration. Now, you may be sitting there saying, um, what does that have to do with the attacks going on in the areas on, um, under rebel control? I will explain. The U.S. president wanted to target the one sector that would cripple the Iranian economy, and that's the oil and gas sector. But what's been, what took place is that they put sanctions on the oil and gas sector, but their main uh, 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 sources of revenue comes, comes from China, India, and Turkey. Now, these three countries are the main buyers of Iranian oil. Now, those buyers had a waiver from the United States. Now, this waiver basically said that everybody else has to stop. Ex stop buying from Iran except those who have a waiver. Turkey had a waiver. India had a waiver. Uh, uh, had a waiver. China had a waiver. And some other small countries had waivers. But as of this past Wednesday, the waivers all came to a halt. That means that the United States government is planning to place sanctions on any country that purchases Iranian gas or oil. Now, this is significant. Why? Because that right away cuts into the revenue that the revenue stream that the Iranian government was using to bankroll Bashar al-Assad and his operation. Is this starting to become clearer now? Basically, what's happening is that the uh, Bashar al-Assad has no real access to oil and gas, and they have no access, no real access to cash. So therefore, they've been heavily relying on the uh, Iranian government for those sources. In addition to that, the group, the, the Lebanese group known as Hezbollah, is also bankrolled and funded by who? By the Iranian government. So. All of these different uh, organizations and governments are all heavily reliant on a healthy uh, flow of cash into the coffers of the Iranian government, and that has stopped. So basically what you're looking at right now is a very, very desperate regime because the regime uh, has been able to fund and continue its attacks and onslaughts because of its, uh, by using its own resources, the Russians and the Iranians. The Iranians are bankrolling many of the militiat or the different militias that are fighting here in Syria. But now when you can remove a portion of that, that not only rem removes the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, which have been taking, which have been carrying out their own attacks, um, on rebel forces, but it also removes the payments that have been made to the different um, organizations and militias that are funded by uh, Iran. It, but now people may be sitting there saying, well, how come they're not getting it from the Russians? Well, the Russians have made clear they're not putting boots on the ground in any major numbers. They've made this very, very clear. They've actually been quite hard on the regime uh, to bolster their numbers. Now, what the regime has done is that they've been picking up people um, off the streets. When somebody passes by a checkpoint, they're like, oh, wait a minute, you're, you're of age to be fighting. And next thing you know, 24 hours later, hours later, somebody went out to buy a slice of pizza and he finds himself in an army barrack. And you may be thinking that's funny, but it's real and it's true and that's exactly what's been taking place. So. What we have been looking at and what we're seeing today are a bunch of weakened warriors which are donning the, 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 uh, the uniforms of the Syrian Arab army, but they're relying heavily on Iranian troops and Iranian resources now. Let's take a look and see what's been happening these days and see if we can make the connection. The regime cannot even supply oil and gas to people under regime controlled areas. First problem. Second problem. We are seeing, and I've been touring some of these border areas um, on the rebel side, and we're seeing reduced troop numbers from the Iranian side. That's the second thing. Third thing, there have been clashes between Iranian-backed militias and other militias um, on the regime side. 
And a lot of these uh, clashes have been the result, or I should say have been caused by a lack of funding. And this is what's been taking place. So now, our theory is that the regime is seeing that perhaps in six to nine months, they may not be able to mount an assault on uh, rebel forces, any type of serious assault. So therefore, they may be launching these attacks now because they see that these biting sanctions from, from Washington are removing approximately 50 to 60% of their strength because the Russians by their air power cannot win this alone. Now, there's another interesting point that we wanna take a look at here, and that is the regime is using barrel bombs all over again. Now, you may be sitting there saying, barrel bombs pack a huge impact, which is true, but barrel bombs are the cheapest way in order to attack from the air by way of the regime. Notice we're not seeing a lot of Russian attacks. We're not. There are some, but most of these attacks are uh, helicopters pushing these barrel bombs packed with explosives and shrapnel um, that have fins on them so that once they land, it detonates and it, and it explodes. So you may be saying, okay, well, what's the connection? The connection is, is that the fancy weaponry that we saw back in 2016 in Aleppo, 2017, when the uh, Color Moon and other areas around Damascus were taken, uh, that a heavy duty weaponry supplied by the Russians and also by the Syrian Arab army are largely non-existent. So that gives weight to the tale that it is perhaps that they simply don't have the funding to be able to continue this onslaught. Now this is something that we're gonna to have to be following up and following um, um, in, in the days um, ahead. Now, let's take a look and see some of the questions that, um, that may be out there. We don't want to take up too much time here, but let's see what's out there. Number one, uh, Ibrahim bin uh, Mazin says, um, is the Hezbollah shaitan or Hezbollah uh, still active in Syria? They are active in Syria and they are uh, still carrying out attacks and defending territory. But we're seeing that they themselves are suffering from fuel or a lack of fuel. They are not able to ship uh, fuel from Lebanon into Syria. Why? Because the Lebanese government is actually blocking it because they don't want fewer, uh, I should say, they do not want to be on the U.S. sanctions list. That would be a debilitating uh, 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 placement for the Lebanese government, so therefore they are not issuing permits for the export of fuel from neighboring Lebanon to Lebanese fighters. And that is very, very, very key. Now, let's take a look and see what uh, uh, Ben Sahrui says. For, uh, for Hezbollah is also funded uh, from d drug dealing in South America and their followers network in Africa. Most Lebanese people in Africa are Shia and are food store keepers. Now, um, I will agree with you that there are a lot of uh, Lebanese businessmen throughout Africa. When I was in the Gambia, um, they have uh, quite a few businesses, but war is a very costly enterprise. I can say I'm not necessarily convinced that those um, contributions from those uh, uh, businessmen are making a real impact here. I think this is mu uh, largely funded by oil and gas Iranian money. This is my uh, feeling and Allah knows best. Okay, let's take a look and we see here. Um, Cape Casablanca says, um, come back to the Ummah, to Brother Ali, stop your sectarian. I think that there's something side going on here. Um, okay, uh, there's a question here that says, are Turkish forces controlling the rebels? Okay, are Turkish forces controlling the rebels? Well, um, there are some groups that are here um, that uh, are directly under Turkish control. They are the, the, the arm of Turkey. There are some groups that are here. But in the free territories, um, most of the groups are not 
under Turkish control. And we're talking about Idlib, we're talking about northern Hema, we're talking about some areas um, in, uh, 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 in uh, the, the countryside of Aleppo. However, in the uh, Zaytun areas, um, which we're talking about Jinderis, we're talking um, um, about other areas in which the Turkish backed uh, Free Syrian Army forces took, they are under Turkish control. Um, but in the Idlib areas and those surrounding areas, those groups are largely not. Um, question that is here uh, from Facebook that says, do you think the rebels will, will win the war? My answer to that question is absolutely yes, I do believe that. Why? Because oppression will not last forever. That will not go, uh, be, uh, that will not continue forever. Whenever you have a, a situation where there's a dictator, there are always people waiting in the wings to be able to spring up and rise up and overthrow that dictator. Now, will that happen today or tomorrow or one year or 10 years from now? I cannot say, but I feel very strongly that the uh, dictatorships that are taking place in so many of the Muslim lands are, uh, are going to come to a close and that's something that I believe both you and I are going to see in the not so distant future and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Um, we have uh, one person that says here, uh, Bilal Abdul Kareem, Jazakallah Khaira, may Allah reward you. Uh, and uh, may Allah uh, reward you as well. Okay, let's take a look and see what we have here. Um, is Turkey going to start an offensive against the YPG? Uh, I really don't know the answer to that question because um, Turkey is always saying that they're going to start a new offensive um, against the YPG. Um, and we haven't seen that as of yet. Sometimes it may be a bargaining uh, tactic and sometimes it's uh, actually for real, but we have to say one thing, their military hardware in large numbers is there and it's ready to go so it could kick off at any time. Um, next question we have here, um, why do the Sunni, uh, Mus uh, Sunni Muslims uh, not come to help the rebels? Well, you may be talking about, well, there are different types of Sunni Muslims. You have Sunni Muslim population and you also have Sunni Muslim governments. Okay, um, first let's talk about Sunni Muslim population. Well, you have foreign fighters that have come here. Um, uh, and to, to help the Syrian people. So people have done that, that's there, and they are continuing to come in, not in the same numbers as before, um, because the borders are harder to cross and so on and so forth. But Sunni Muslims have come in large numbers and they are here fighting from all over the Muslim world. Now that's one side of the divide. The other side of the divide is the uh, Sunni Muslim governments which we could say that a lot of them are just non-Shia and actually do not advance a Sunni Muslim uh, policy and program. And therefore you find that they are much more concerned about uh, their own uh, protection of their governments, their own kursi, their own seats, and they use a lot of the Muslims' resources to police the uh, Muslims. So therefore they don't have the resources to help other Muslim countries because they're only helping themselves. And that's for real. Next. Um, uh, Salam brother Bilal, will the Mujahideen resist the offensive? Um, and also Al-Fatih says, Assalamu alaikum, in your opinion are the rebels strong enough to defend against a regime offensive? Well, you know what, I've got a I, I think I want to answer this question here. I took both of those questions because there's an interesting point that needs to be made here. In my estimation, will the rebels start an offensive? To that, I don't know the answer to that question. But I would say, do I think that they should start an offensive? Uh, I don't think that they actually need to do that because I think that the regime is imploding. I think that whatever strength they have now, talking about the regime of Bashar al-Assad, will be less than what it will be three or six months from now. So I think, and I am not a military tactician, but I think that if they were to hold their forces,
their fire. The regime is weaker than it was back in October when the fuel uh, that was coming in, in large uh, numbers from Iran stopped. It stopped. So they're weaker now in May than they were in October, and I feel that in August they'll be weaker than they are in May. This is my opinion. I am not a military tactician, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Okay, now let's take a look and see what we have here. Um, uh, Nasser Jamal Khan said, Mujahideen should encourage innocent civilians to migrate into neighboring Turkey and if not possible, build trenches and bunkers to get rid of the direct attack of airstrikes. Um, you know something? There are so many of the civilians which are doing just that that are helping rebel fighters. Um, where do the rebel fighters come from? They come from the civilian population. And a good portion of the civilians understand and realize that, the, that their fortunes are tied to rebel, uh, uh, rebel strength or the lack of it. If there is a lack of rebel strength, that could mean that, the, um, that their fortunes will go south if the regime takes over these territories. Now, as I said, uh, we here at OGN have been touring some of those areas. We have a report coming out probably on Sunday, inshallah, um, of our tour of um, rebel uh, defenses that they've been putting together in the Latakia area, and I think that you should check that out. Um, next, we'll go back to um, Facebook and says, uh, what is the ideology behind the Sri Lanka attack last week? I think that that was the ideology of the Khawarij or the ideology of those people of Takfir or the ideology of ISIS. Um, and as we've seen, the ideology of ISIS brings nothing but, uh, but blood, destruction, and hardship on the Muslims. It is a destructive ideology and it is one that will not bring any benefit to the Muslims. We saw a, um, a uh, statement by uh, ISIS leader Abu Bakr Baghdadi who crawled out of the woodwork after four years, hasn't been seen. Um, some people say, well, he's done audio uh, statements and all. Okay, like this is like 2019. Um, if you can do audio, you can do video also. Uh, so I'm not really sure what's behind that. And Allah knows best. Um, okay, we have here, um, uh, do you think that ISIS is backed by some Western countries? Um, no. I am not a conspiracy theorist. I do not think that they are backed by Western countries, but I do think that the Western countries and Israel um, all take advantage of the shenanigans and foolishness of ISIS, and they use that to cripple um, uh, 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 good intending rebel forces that have a right to defend their lands and um, so this is what I think. Uh, I will think that we will take just maybe one or two more questions um, and we will say, uh, Samantha Daniel said, why did Saudi Arabia stop helping the rebels? The Saudi um, government uh, was helping the rebels for their own personal gain um, and not because of helping the Syrian people. And as the war went on, basically their masters, the Americans, told them to stop. And that's as clear as I can make it for you. Um, okay. Um, okay, uh, Riyadh Ahmed says, um, why are so many groups uh, operating in Syria and how are they fragmented in such a manner? Well, the reality of the situation is that um, these different groups are, um, you know, some of them have, are backed by foreign powers and therefore their agendas are not necessarily Syrian made. Um, I remember that we were with one group one time and they said, and I asked them, do you think that you will uh, start an offensive? And they literally told me, well, if they say from outside we fight, we fight. If they say we don't fight, we don't fight. And I thought that that was very depressing um, because that means that your revolution as Syrians, um, at least for this particular group, was owned by foreigners. And you seem to be okay with that. I guess as long as his uh, monthly salary was there, 
um, and he's playing the role of a mercenary, he doesn't really care. All right. Um, uh, as someone made mention here, um, how can they help our organization? Well, uh, we have a Patreon um, that you could help us by your monthly donation, which will help us to do more programs like this, to, um, to go to more places, put more gas in the car, pay more salaries, and buy more equipment. We can bring you better coverage than, um, than we're currently doing, so please take a look at um, our uh, Facebook and also take a look at um, our Twitter and you'll see where it says Patreon and you can actually donate to us. And if you haven't found that, just direct message us and we will just steer you in the right um, direction. Um, yes. Okay, so we have a, a question here by Bentley Forler that says, which U.S. 2020 candidate is the best one to help the rebels? Bernie Sanders, Joe Biden, or Donald Trump? All right. Well, let's see if we can put this into proper perspective. The, uh, 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 I would say that Donald Trump is um, a horrible president. And I don't think that he's good for the American people or anybody else. I don't even think that he's good for himself. Joe Biden is uh, basically a part of the eight years of, um, of uh, Barack Obama. He was his vice president. So I don't think we should expect a whole lot different from Joe Biden that we saw from Barack Obama. And we saw horrible devastation, upticks in, in uh, and uh, drone strikes and all of the things that exacerbated the situation in this, uh, in, in this region. So I can't say that it would be Joe Biden. But if we want to talk about Bernie Sanders, um, I could be wrong. I, Allah knows best. But I don't necessarily look for someone who is good for the rebels or good for this one or good for that one. I look at the one that would be most likely to have a real dialogue with them concerning um, international affairs, i.e. Uh, uh, this region, Syria, and so on and so forth. I would probably have to say personally that I think that Bernie Sanders would be the one most likely to have a dialogue with them. Um, you cannot have a dialogue with a donkey, and therefore you cannot have a dialogue with Donald Trump. Did I just call Donald Trump a donkey? I guess I did. So anyway, you can't have a dialogue with him. So you don't have a real opportunity to accomplish anything under a Trump administration. Okay, everybody, this is as far as we're going to take it here today. My name is Bilal Abdul Karim, and this has been our live Q&A. Once again, if you would like to donate to us, we would be more than grateful to accept uh, any donations that you possibly could to help us to bring more authentic information to you uh, here from uh, northern Syria. Once again, I'm Bilal Abdul Karim. Jazakum Allahu khaira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.